Chapter 19, Laboratory Number 2. By early 1943, the Soviet Army had finally halted the massive German invasion just short of the Soviet cities of Stalingrad, Moscow, and Leningrad. The greatest military achievement in all history, praised Douglas MacArthur, a top American general. But the fighting raged on with some of the biggest battles in the history of war taking place on the blood-soaked Soviet soil that spring. Joseph Stalin, the Soviet premier, called desperately for the Americans and British to launch an invasion of German-held Western Europe. This would force Hitler to fight on two fronts, taking pressure off the Soviets. President Franklin Roosevelt and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill told Stalin it was coming. American and British troops were just beginning their attack on Germany's ally, Italy, and American forces were locked into ferocious battles with Japan all over the Pacific. A major invasion of Western Europe was still a year away. Americans continued shipping weapons to the Soviets, but the atomic bomb remained a secret. In fact, Roosevelt and Churchill signed a special agreement vowing to keep it that way. It was the job of arming counterintelligence to guard the world's most dangerous secret, not just from the Germans, but from the Soviets as well. So CIC officers were determined to investigate any suspicious behavior, especially when it came from the director of Los Alamos. On June 14th, CIC agents tailed Oppenheimer onto a train heading from Berkeley to San Francisco. At the San Francisco station, they watched as Oppenheimer was greeted by a tall woman with dark hair. They recognized her as Jean Tatlock, a former girlfriend of Oppenheimer's and a member of the Communist Party. Oppenheimer and Tatlock walked arm in arm to Tatlock's car, got in, and drove off. The agents followed the car to a Mexican restaurant in San Francisco. Oppenheimer and Tatlock went inside, had dinner and drinks, then drove to her apartment and entered together. The agent sat in her car watching the windows. Tatlock's lights went out at 11.30. Oppenheimer was not observed until 8.30 a.m. the next day, the agents reported, when he and Jean Tatlock left the building together. The agent sent the report to Lieutenant Colonel Boris Posh, the top Army intelligence officer on the West Coast. He'd already suspected Oppenheimer of disloyalty. Now he was seriously alarmed. Posh reported to General Grove's office in Washington, D.C., suggesting that the subject is, still is or may be connected with the Communist Party. Posh believed that Oppenheimer was either handing secrets directly to the Soviets or he may be making that information available to his other contacts, Gene Tatlock, for instance. Posh strongly recommended that Oppenheimer be removed completely from the project and dismissed from the employment by the U.S. government. Groves refused. He had no idea what Oppenheimer and Tatlock had been up to in her apartment. He didn't want to know. He trusted Oppenheimer's loyalty. Besides, his number one worry was to build an atomic bomb before Hitler did. For this, he said, Oppenheimer is irreplaceable. If anything happens to Oppenheimer, he added, the project will be set back at least six months. Grove's word was final, but if Army counterintelligence couldn't get rid of Oppenheimer, they could certainly let him know how they felt. In the future, please avoid seeing your questionable friends, Colonel Keith Nicholas told Oppenheimer, and remember, whenever you leave Los Alamos, we will be tailing you. This frightened Oppenheimer. He had no idea how long intelligence agents had been following him or what they already knew about his private life. Suddenly worried about losing his position at Los Alamos, he decided to tell Colonel Posh about the time six months earlier that his friend Haken Chevalier had approached him about sharing information with the Soviets. Oppenheimer repeated the brief conversation he had with Chevalier. He assured Posh the subject had not come up again. Oppenheimer hoped this confession would convince Posh of his loyalty. Instead, Posh was more suspicious than ever. Had the Chevalier meeting really had been that innocent? Posh wondered. If so, why did Oppenheimer wait so long to tell us about it? Posh dashed off another member to grow, this time accusing Oppenheimer of playing a key part in the attempts of the Soviet Union to secure by espionage highly secret information, which is vital to the security of the United States. Again, Groves defended the man he'd chosen. Army counterintelligence and the FBI still believed Oppenheimer was sneaking information to the Soviets. There's no key ev evidence that he was. Soviet memos and cables from the time show that the KGB never gave up hope of cultivating Oppenheimer, but never made any progress either. Meanwhile, the Soviet atomic bomb project was moving ahead. In mid-1943, the Soviet government established Laboratory No. 2, a secret lab in the Pine Woods outside Moscow. 
The job of building the Soviet bomb was put in the hands of a 40-year-old physicist named Igor Khrushchev. With the resources short during wartime, Khrushchev and his team badly needed help from the Soviet spies. Intelligence was still coming in from Klaus books in Britain, and it was good stuff. The material as a whole, reported to Khrushchev, showed that it, te it is technically possible to solve the entire uranium problem in a much shorter period than our scientists believe. But what Khrushchev really needed was specific information on the bomb design, and there was only one place to get it. It is extremely important, he said, to receive detailed technical material on this problem from America. In Moscow, KGB officers were intensely frustrated by how little they uncovered about the Manhattan Project. In the presence of this research work, Moscow ca cabled its spies in America, vast both in scale and scope, being conducted right here next to you, the slow pace of agent cultivation in the USA is particularly intolerable. What exactly were the Americans doing? The Soviets would never know, not until the KGB could get a scientist inside the Manhattan Project. Then, in late 1943, the KGB got its first big break. It happened because the work at Los Alamos was proving even more difficult than Oppenheimer had expected. He needed more talent and fast. The British government agreed to send Oppenheimer a team of top physicists. In November, Klaus Fuchs sailed for America. A few weeks later, Harry Gold got a call from his KGB contact, Simon Semyonov. Gold was needed in New York City right away. Gold hurried to the meeting place, a dark restaurant. He saw right away that Sam was extremely excited, more so than I had ever seen him before. Gold asked if this had something to do with the industrial spies he'd been picking up information from the, over the past couple of years. Forget them, Semyonov said. Forget everything you ever knew about them. You are never to see them or meet them or have anything to do with them again. Gold was too stunned to respond. Something has come up, the Russian continued, and it is so big and so tremendous that you have got to exert your complete efforts to carrying it through successfully. You've got to concentrate on it completely. Before you make a single move in connection with this, you are to think. Think twice. Think three times. You cannot make any mistakes.